Okay, finishing up Young Goodman Brown. I, I took off the slide and just made it my own webcam capture. So you'll be seeing my face the whole time and that'll make it even spookier. Now, um, as the story progresses, Goodman Brown's going deeper and deeper into the forest. Um, he, start, he starts to hear voices of people that he thinks, you know, he recognizes from the town. And this is on page 350. Um, looks like uh, the large paragraph just beyond half point. Uh, and he says, and this is about the middle of the paragraph, uh, Hawthorne writes, once the listener fancied, fancied that he could distinguish the accents of townspeople of his own, men and women, both pious and ungodly, many of whom he had met at the communication, at the communion table and had seen others writing at the tavern. The next moment, so indistinct were the sounds, he doubted whether he had heard aught, that means anything, the murmur of the old forest whispering without a wind. Now notice we're getting all of this through young Goodman Brown's perception, right? We don't know if it's actually happening outside of his head or not. Um, is something really manifesting out there in the woods or is he slowly going crazy or being possessed? Now, um, he then hears, you know, a voice of a young woman crying, her lamentations, and he thinks maybe it's Faith. May Faith is gone, and boy, there, you know, there's that ambiguity again there, right? And, it, and again, it might feel a little heavy-handed to us, um, but in the context of when it was written and what Hawthorne was doing, um, I, I think we can definitely keep ourselves and our minds open and a little bit more credible to that kind of structuring. Okay, so on page 351, he's going so crazy that he starts to just run away. He says, my faith is gone. There is no good on earth and sin is but a name. I don't know exactly what that's supposed to mean. That feels pretty broad and vague to me. Um, and man with despair, oh, and then he says, and sin is but a name, come devil, for to thee this is this world given. And here's that idea of the world that is fallen, right? Um, and again, this is reacting against the enlightenment mode of thinking, which is that there is good in the world, um, and it's found through reason and compassion and logic and science. And it even goes against like that light romanticism view of the world. Um, or that transcendentalist view of the world, which is based on romanticism, right? The idea that, you know, there is divine and good, there's divine and God in everything, nature and people. But anyway, Goodman Brown um, is maddened with despair, so that he laughed loud and long and grasped his staff and set forth at such a rate that he seemed to fly along the forest path rather than to walk or run. He set forth at such a rate that he seemed to fly rather than walk or run. Um, now here's the thing. He seemed to fly according to whom? To himself? Is he that mad out of his head? Another way of looking at it is that we as the viewer, as the audience, are also involved in this story. We too are the voyeurs not being able to make up our minds. And that idea of that kind of like romanticist gaze is present in, all, in the horror genre a lot. And it certainly is present on the screen too. A lot of the time when you're watching a horror movie, um, you know what's going to happen, or you have a pretty good idea. The monster or the psychopath or whatever is sneaking up on somebody, um, and you're viewing it start to happen. Um, there's something similar going on here. And towards the end of it, you know, he thinks he's hearing Indians. This is the same paragraph. And then again, think about um, the native 
or the person outside of civilized society. That's also a romanticist construct or conceit. Um, the whole forces people by fright, frightful sounds, creaking of trees, howling of wild beasts. There's all this dark romanticism again. Um, it was as if all of nature were laughing him to scorn. And he, look where it goes from here. But he himself was the chief horror of the scene and shrank not from its other horrors. He was the chief horror. That means that, you know, his subjective reality, his experience is the dominant force on the scene. It's not whatever is going on around him. It is he himself. And that's a very subjective, very romanticist notion. And on and on he goes. He keeps going. Uh, that next large paragraph, Hawthorne writes, In truth, all through the haunted forest, there could be nothing more frightful than the figure of Goodman Brown. On he flew, and there's that flight again, among the black pines, brandishing his staff with frenzied gestures, now giving vent to an inspiration of horrid blasphemy, and now shouting forth such laughter as set all the echoes of the forest laughing like demons around him. The fiend in his own shape is less hideous than when he rages in the breast of man. So in other words, here again we see an example of the Romanticist mindset. You know, it's not the thing itself that is scary. Um, it's when it is inside somebody's subjective experience. So he's running and he's running. Um, he finally comes to a scene that looks like what we might call a black mass, some kind of uh, occult or uh, devil worshiping ceremony. And a lot of these parallel, I mean, at least in, uh, at least in representations of it that are, that have been established in literature and religious texts, they, are, they almost seem like a parody or some kind of misrepresentation or thwarting of a traditional Christian ceremony like a mass. So he sees all of these people there, um, and it seems to be everybody he knows at this evil devil worshiping mass of some kind. And um, this is the first very large paragraph on 352. He says, at least there were high dames well known to her. Uh, oh, let me go one sentence back, back above. Um, among them, quivering to and fro between the gloom and splendor, appeared faces that would be seen next day at the council board of the province, and others which, Sabbath after Sabbath, looked devoutly heavenward and benignantly, that means goodly, over the crowded pews from the holiest pulpits in the land. Some affirm that the lady of the governor was there. At least there were some high dames well known to her, and wives of honored husbands, and widows, and a great multitude, and ancient maidens, all of excellent repute, and young fair girls who trembled lest their mothers should espy them. Either the sudden gleams of light flashing over the obscure field bedazzled Goodman Brown, or he recognized a score of the church members of Salem Village, famous for their especial sanctity. So all the good people are here at this mass. And this is like a real nightmare situation. What you think is correct is incorrect. What is up is now down. What you thought is white is really black. Good old Deacon Gookin had arrived and waited at the skirts of that veritable saint, his revered pastor, but irreverently consorting with these grave, reputable, and pious people, these elders of the church, these chaste dames and dewy virgins, they were men of dissolute lives, um, you know, men of, you know, loose morals, party animals, and women of spotted fame, you know, that means like less than pristine reputation. Um, wretches given over to all mean and filthy vice and suspected even of horrid crimes. It was strange to see that the good shrank not from the wicked, nor were the sinners abashed by the saints. So here's an interesting scene too, because one of the things that Romanticism does, like Transcendentalism does, is it erases boundaries, especially boundaries made through reason or civilization or um, some kind of hierarchy built around structures that humans have created. So good and bad, that line's erased. 
moral and immoral, those differences, that line is erased. Pious and heretical or blasphemous, that line is erased. And once again, we're left with this kind of shuttling back and forth between those extremes. Is it one thing or is it the other? And young Goodman Brown is feeling those, that shuttling, that vacillation, that sense of ambiguity, that, that, that sense that nothing can be ultimately known within himself. So then there's more of that dark mass ceremony and it's kind of standard fare, I think. But uh, towards the end is I think where it gets really interesting uh, once again. Uh, second to last paragraph on page 554, I, I'm sorry, 354. Second to last paragraph of the story, this tiny little paragraph. Now remember when you see a small paragraph somewhere, it's usually because the writer wants to make an emphatic point that sticks. Paragraph breaks are all about a place where you get to take a tiny little mental rest before, go, before going on to a new series of ideas. So it adds extra impact and emphasis. So let's take a look at what it says here. Had Goodman Brown fallen asleep in the forest and only dreamed a wild dream of a witch hunt, a witch meeting? Um, you tell me, you're the one who wrote the story, but that question is being put forward to Goodman Brown in his mind. And similarly, it's being put forward to us as readers and as, a, if you want to put it another way, as voyeurs of the story. And, and uh, 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 Hawthorne is going to give us no help here at all. Be it so, if you will. Okay, well, it's up to you. What do I know? He's the one who wrote the story, but he's being really slippery. That slipperiness is super important to romanticism, dark romanticism. Um, but alas, it was a dream of evil omen for young Goodman Brown. A stern, a sad, a darkly meditative, a distrustful, if not a desperate man did he become from the night of that fearful dream. So now he's just saying it is a dream. On the Sabbath day, when the congregation were singing a holy psalm, he could not listen because an anthem of sin rushed loudly upon his ear and drowned all the blessed strain. When the minister spoke from the pulpit with power and fervid eloquence and with his hand on the open Bible, the sacred truths of our religion, notice once again, we're getting sucked into the story. We're, we're not only voyeurs, we're participants. This is all our religion. We're Puritans too. Another erasure of a boundary of, um, of the sacred truths of our religion and, the, and of saint-like lives and triumphant deaths and of future bliss or misery unutterable. Then did Goodman Brown turn pale, dreading lest the roof should thunder down upon the gray blasphemer and his hearers. Often awakening suddenly at midnight, it's pretty good timing, he shrank from the bosom of faith and at morning or eventide, when the family knelt down at prayer, he scowled and muttered to himself and gazed sternly at his wife and turned away. And when he had long lived and was born to his grave, a hoary corpse, followed by faith, an aged woman, and children and grandchildren, a goodly procession, besides neighbors, not a few, they carved no hopeful verse upon his tombstone, for his dying hour was gloom. Yeah, it's a, real, it's a real uplifting ending, but you're going to see that in dark romanticism. You're going to see that in American Gothicism. You know, it, it's, it's part of the genre. And what's also part of this genre, what we really need to keep in mind, is that that hour of gloom, we don't know if it was because of him going mad or losing his faith, his belief in religion, or if it's because he really did witness this upside down, black mass with all the good people of his parish and his province and the devil right there doing all that stuff. And the genre will always make you wonder about if it's an inside damnation or an external damnation. That's a great place to leave it. I'll see you next time.